a biologist, and ever since my earliest childhood, I'd been interested in animals and plants. I kept a lot of pets when I was a child. Dog, uh, pigeons, a jackdaw, a budgerigar, a hamster, a rabbit, caterpillars, tadpoles, um, and other animals. My father was a microscopist and showed me lots of amazing things through the microscope. So from an early age, this really fired my imagination. I studied biology at school and then at Cambridge University. Um, and then I did a PhD in developmental biology, working on plants. I studied biochemistry. Uh, I taught cell biology at Cambridge. Um, and I also studied history and philosophy of science at Harvard. I felt that the approach to life in biology was too narrow. I loved animals and plants, but I wasn't happy with the idea they were nothing but machines, explainable in terms of nothing but molecules. Um, so I always found that much too narrow. The history and philosophy of science enabled me to get a broader perspective. And I also got a very, very big enlargement of my horizons when I went to work in India. I worked in an international crop research institute on uh, developing new varieties of crops and new cropping systems, in particular pigeon peas and chickpeas. Um, and I lived in India for seven years and that was a wonderful experience scientifically, working in the field, working with farmers, doing practical research. Um, but it was also a wonderful experience philosophically because in India people discuss bigger questions than they do in Europe in, in a, on a broader canvas and I liked that very much. Um, when I was at Cambridge I came up with the idea of morphic resonance, memory and nature, uh, which sees the laws of nature as more like habits. I continued thinking about that in India and while I was in India wrote my first book, A New Science of Life, uh, which sets out that theory. In some ways, um, that has changed my scientific career because it goes beyond conventional science. Uh, it opens up new perspectives. And I found a, a rather ambiguous reception to this among my scientific colleagues. Some people really love the idea of opening science up. Others get upset because they think it's heretical. Um, but I myself believe that science is a method of inquiry it's the best method of inquiry we have. I love doing experiments and designing experiments. And I think there are a lot of areas that scientists have avoided because they're taboo. They don't fit in with the prevailing dogmas. And some of those concern the unexplained powers of animals. As a child, I became fascinated with these through the pigeons I kept. I wanted to know how pigeons found their way home. Nobody knew then, and nobody knows now. And it made me aware of the fact there's a lot science doesn't understand about animals. Um, I wrote a book about the unexplained powers of animals, dogs that know when their owners are coming home. And then another book about the unexplained powers of people, the sense of being stared at and other aspects of the extended mind, uh, investigating psychic phenomena in animals and people. I think these phenomena uh, fit in with a larger view of nature with what I call morphic fields. Um, I think they enlarge the frontiers of science. I don't think they need to be taboos. Um, I think a lot of things that at present are called paranormal or supernatural are actually normal or natural. Um, and I also think that as we broaden our view of science, uh, the frontiers between science and religion change. All sorts of new dialogues become possible. And my own view is that this broader science, which goes beyond the dogmatic materialism that still dominates a large part of institutional science, uh, is much more friendly to uh, spiritual experience and to religious traditions. And that instead of science and religion being in warfare or conflict, uh, they can enter into a much more productive realm uh, of dialogue and I think that many things are changing at the moment. Things are changing in science, things are changing in our whole culture and my own particular interest is this broadening of the scientific perspective. So I think of myself as an experimental scientist and 
also as someone who's interested in the philosophy of nature. In England, science used to be called natural philosophy, the philosophy of nature, until the 19th century. Um, or it used to be called experimental philosophy. And I think those are rather good terms. Um, so what I'm doing now in my most recent book, The Science Delusion, or Science Set Free, um, is uh, looking at the fundamental dogmas of science, the ten basic dogmas of science, turning them into questions and showing how science opens up when you do that.